Okay. Lesson two, part two. English is a crazy language. Understand that your problems in reading and writing are probably due to the fact that English is a very difficult language to work with. It's probably the hardest language to understand and learn and to use. Mandarin Chinese is considered to be the hardest language as far as its structure is concerned because the change of a simple line or a dot changes the entire meaning of a word or a phrase. But Mandarin Chinese is consistent. It's stable. It's laws and rules are uniform they don't change english hey we don't like a rule we're going to make an exception to it in fact we have lots of exceptions to our rules we have inconsistent pronunciations look at this o u g h can be pronounced nine different ways that's insane um, and our words have many different meanings to them take the word run for instance probably has 12 or 13 definitions the word fly seven or eight um, they can be nouns, they can be verbs, they can be descriptive words. I mean, it's just crazy that this one word can mean that many different things. You're trying to explain to somebody about, you were at the baseball game and you saw them hit a fly, and the person you're talking to is sitting there thinking, they took a baseball bat to whack a little bug? No, 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 a fly ball. They hit the ball so it flew out into the, oh, never mind. <laughs> It's, it, it's very difficult for people to figure all this out because just when they think they've got a grasp on something, here comes another exception. Here comes something different. So, how did it get this way? It's because English started out as a combination of two languages. The Anglo-Saxon, which is a Germanic language, and French, which is a Romantic language. Anglo-Saxon, being Germanic, is very um, guttural. It's, um, it's a harsher language. So, for instance, this little clip from Beowulf here. What we got in the Ingel Degum, Theodor Kinga, Slim Geflundum, Hutha Thathlingus, Ellen Fernandum. Right, that's not very good, but you get the idea. And then you listen to French. Tu te toi et je te moi, nous estons. I just messed that up. Tu te toi et je te moi, nous étions deux avant cette fois. Je toi, je te l'étions avant que je sois et tu étais le mien, maintenant et toujours. Oh, it's so smooth. It flows. It really has a beautiful sound to it. Anglo-Saxon. We pronounce every letter. Every letter has a sound to it, and we do not skip them. And there's lots of... <coughs> then we get to the French, and everything just sort of smoothly runs into the next one. We run one word into the next, and we drop the last sound of most words. In fact, lots of sounds are not pronounced in French, so you get very confused. Lots of soft sounds. Et toi, roi, et moi, nous deux, avant... And, and if that was Anglo-Saxon, it would be Tu etes toi et jetes moi It would really sound weird. So yeah, we get these two getting mushed together. How did it get to be that way? Why did we do that? Well, the problem started in 1066 AD. We have a group of people living down here in Normandy, which is in northern France. They were originally Vikings who settled there quite a while ago. And, you know, having Viking blood, they like violence. They want to conquer. Meanwhile, just across the English Channel is Anglo-Saxony. Now, the Normans cannot go fighting around in France. They have a treaty that says, okay, we're allowed to live here as long as we don't go beating up on our neighbors. Well, you know, William, who is now the king of Normandy, wants to conquer. He wants to prove what a tough guy he is. So he can't fight around in France, but he can cross the channel over here. And there's been a long history of problems between Normandy and Anglo-Saxony anyway. So he bides his time, and at one point, the king of Norway attacks, because there's some Norwegian people living up here, and he decides they should be paying him taxes. So Harold, who is the king of the Anglo-Saxons, marches out of London, comes up here and does this big battle with the Norwegians, wins the day, and the Norwegians sail off. In the meantime, 
William, having heard about that battle going on up there, quickly got his army together, loaded them on ships, and started sailing for Anglo-Saxony. Now, fortunately, spies had gotten back up here and got to Harold and said, Hey, dude, you know what's happening, man? Those, those Normans, those crazy-ass Normans, they're mounting up their ships to come over here and invade. So William, or not William, sorry, Harold quickly mustered his, his troops and did a forced march back down here to try to catch up with the Normans, who landed in Hastings. So there was a big battle right here at Hastings, at the top of a hill, the Anglo-Saxons and Harold dug in and hid behind their shields, behind trees, anything they could, and just said, you want to conquer us? You're going to have to work for it, buddy. So the Normans, who had better armor, better weapons, such, had horses, had to go up this huge hill to fight them. So they were wearing themselves out with each charge. Four times the Normans charged up that hill. Four times the Anglo-Saxons beat them back. And so William's thinking, I'm just about done. My men are about to mutiny on me. They're going to leave. Um, if I don't get it on this time, we're, we're, we're finished. So he says, one more time, one more time. Archers, fire. And the archers shoot. And as luck would have it, Harold happened to look over his shield at that moment. And an arrow flew over and right into his eye, into his brain, killing him instantly. Now, the Anglo-Saxons had a big vacuum in leadership at this point. They didn't know who to listen to, who to follow, and they basically fell apart. The Normans charged up the hill and broke up the army pretty quickly and then marched up, took London, and took control of the country. Here's the problem. The Normans speak French. The people here speak Anglo-Saxon. The leaders can't talk to the people they're trying to control. So how do we get around this? Well, the Normans have to learn some Anglo-Saxon and the Anglo-Saxons have to learn some French. So words started mixing up between the two languages. We picked and chose the ones we liked, and we got this mixed up new language called English. To make matters worse, the Catholic Church comes in at this time. The Catholic Church is mulling around saying, hey, you want to go to heaven? You got to go to church. You go to church, you have to learn Latin because the Bible was written in Latin at that time. Latin is a dead language. Nobody speaks it anymore. It's just a means the church uses for power because nobody really understands Latin except for the highly educated. So it was a way of maintaining control over people. They could sit there and read the Bible to you and you have no idea what it's saying, but you listen to what the priest said because you want to go to heaven. So when the priest said, you have to pay me gold if you want to go to heaven, you paid him gold. Until somebody finally realized, hey, there's nowhere in the Bible that says I have to do this. Of course, that doesn't happen for another five or six hundred years. So, lots of Latin phrases from the Bible are being picked up and getting incorporated into the English language. By 1750, the English had actually become a very powerful nation and during the age of exploration when Columbus and da Gama and all those people were roaming around the world figuring out what all was out here you know the French were, were too busy fighting among themselves they're, they're they're having well they were fighting with England and fighting with Spain and they were they really couldn't invest too much in colonialism and you know none of the other countries really could deal with colonialism the Spanish were just looking for gold but England was smart. England said, we are going to take over. So England took control of all of Canada and at this time actually had the 13 colonies because we're not going to declare a revolution for at least another 26 years. So um, the English had some control in South America, some islands here in the Caribbean. The English had the Falklands down here. The English have control of a good chunk of Africa, of the Middle East. They're all across South Asia. Look, they have all of India and Siam, several places in the Pacific Islands, and all of Australia is now theirs. So the expression came to be known as that the sun never sets on the British Empire, meaning that at any given time of the day, the sun was shining on some piece of land that England controlled. Now, of course, this meant in order to communicate with the native people, we had to absorb some of their language. So we're picking up a lot of words from India, from Siam, a lot of words from Africa, some Middle East words. We are picking up Native American language. 
the English language is getting more convoluted. So finally, as all these new words are creeping in, Samuel Johnson in England in the early 1740s decides we're going to have to write a dictionary. It took him a while to get it. By 1755, he published a two-volume set saying these are the rules of grammar in English and here's how words should be spelled. We will now have a consistency in our spelling. Well, there's a problem. People in America didn't like that. America said, look, you left out a lot of words that we use. We don't use some of these words that you have. And uh, we don't like your way of doing grammar. And we don't like some of your spellings. So Noah Webster in the 1800s wrote his own dictionary. So now American English is very different from British English. Don't even go into Australian English. Finally, as science starts coming along in the early 1800s, we're creating lots of new words to describe all these new discoveries. And at first we started off with a lot of Greek and Latin, but they were awkward. Greek and Latin, you know, the people who are doing most of these discoveries were speaking English. So why are we using a foreign language to describe it? They started finding ways to say it in English. And in time, especially by World War II, America is dominating the world in business. So if you want to do business, you've got to learn English. For a short time, we thought maybe Japanese was going to take over, like in the 60s and 70s. But English won out. This is why, say, um, in Germany, for instance, everybody's required to learn English from kindergarten on up. So the English language is constantly evolving, constantly changing, and is just crazy to try to understand. Why do we call this thing here a mouse? I mean... I could tell you why, but it's kind of silly if you ask me. There's probably something, but I would have called it a clicker or something like that. You know, who made these decisions? Why is English going the way it is? It's constantly changing. Check just within your lifetime. We've probably added close to a thousand words to the English language. Um, the word rap had a totally different meaning before. Rap before it meant to punch somebody, to tap them. Now it means to sing. Who knows? Language is nuts. So you're struggling trying to express yourself as best you can with a language that fights with you. Congratulations, you're not as bad as you thought you were.